Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Dear Christian friends, you may remember all the way back to maybe it was middle school for, for some of us, but probably, likely, high school, that you remember everybody's favorite part of history sitting in the lunchroom, the cafeteria. And all of the drama and the big decisions that went along with that, like, where am I going to sit to eat lunch? Which table am I going to associate with? Is it going to be uh, the, the cool people? Is it going to be the, the athletes? Is it going to be the, the cheerleaders? Is it going to be the, the book nerds? Is it going to be the artsy? Is it going to be the class clown? Is it going to be, or, or the other side of that, if it's not just holding your tray or carrying your lunch and, and you're trying to identify, it's then the flip side of you having your seat and then watching everybody else come in wondering who's going to sit by me. Not them. Not her. He's okay. If, if you didn't have that experience, well, maybe there's a, a movie that, that comes to mind. If you remember the Life is Like a, a Box of Chocolate guy, Forrest Gump? I shared this in my email this morning, a video clip from Forrest Gump, where he's a, a little boy getting onto the bus, and he, he points out to the bus driver, my mom said uh, never to have anything to do with strangers, so he tells his name, and then she says his name, and he says, okay, now we're not strangers. And he gets onto the bus, and then he's looking down the aisle for a spot to sit, and one student after another, next to an open space, says, not here. Don't sit here. You had that experience? Were you the individual that, that was told there's, there's no room for you here? Or on the flip side, were you the individual that communicated that to somebody else? Either way, we've, we've experienced that. And, and really, what's at the heart of that whole issue, that, that drama? It's my image, isn't it? When you, you talk about where to sit in the, the lunchroom in the cafeteria, it's all about your image. What are people going to think if I sit with this group, or if I allow this individual to sit with me, my image matters. I, I have to be careful what people are going to think of me, what they're going to associate with. And that, that doesn't really change after middle school or high school, does it? The same thing happens in, in different ways today. It might be a, a work party, a Christmas party, not too far around the corner now. And, and you consider very carefully who you associate with, somebody that you can rub elbows with that is maybe going to help with a promotion or, or that's going to, to move you along in a company versus um, your, your beat farmer neighbor who is a little less than desirable co-worker in the workplace, the individual that isn't, doesn't have a really great reputation that does nothing for you. We do the same thing. We care about our image. And if you unpack that a little bit more, dig a little bit deeper, what does it really mean that we care so much about our image, but that we don't want our pride to be wounded? Pride is really at the heart of the issue, isn't it? It's what drives why we associate with, with whom we do. And so Jesus this morning, in, in what you heard from the gospel, flips that on its head, and he actually associates with the the undesirables in society. Those that, that's the hoity-toity, the religious elite, anybody with any name or reputation would have nothing to do. And, and Jesus embraces those individuals, particularly this one named Matthew. And even if you're not all that familiar with the Bible, uh, in the New Testament, one thing that, that a lot of people are aware of is that tax collectors did not have a very favorable reputation. Now, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm not sure that, that anybody here, uh, that this applies to you, but it's kind of like if, if you work for the IRS and somebody asks you what you do for a living, you probably are super excited to say, I work for the IRS. And they say, oh, do you? That's great. That's wonderful, right? <laughs> no. And, and, and take that and ratchet it up to the time of Jesus. Not only was that less than desirable as a tax collector, but as a, a, an individual Jewish, you were, you were seen, if you were a Jew as a tax collector, you were working for the enemy. You were working for the Roman, the oppressive Roman government. 
And so not only were you just, okay, yeah, you collect taxes, but you were viewed as the enemy and as public enemy, number one, and, and a criminal, really, because all the Roman government expected of you was to get a certain amount, and anything that you skimmed over and above that was yours to pocket as you saw fit. So they had a, a very obvious and well-deserved reputation as being scum, because that's what they were. And that's who Jesus approached. Jesus does what Jesus so often does in the New Testament. We see him here eating with sinners. But you notice that, that it started long before the meal that he had with Matthew. It started with Jesus actually going to Matthew in the workplace to approach him while he was collecting taxes, while he was, was clocked in for a workday. And that probably is a good reminder for us when you're when you're out and about running your errands and you're in some sector of the service industry and you see somebody with a name tag, maybe address them by that name. Maybe give them a little extra time that, that Jesus did here to Matthew. And not only that, but when we do that, when we do acknowledge other people, and, and we have to do it sometimes in the workplace, right? It's your job. You have to be nice to other people. You have to be nice to the boss. If there's a party, you have to be respectful because you're getting paid to some degree to do that. But not Jesus. There was nothing in this for him to go to, to Matthew, to associate with him, to seek him out in, in his while he was at work. Jesus wasn't saying, well, I need to diversify my group of disciples, or I need a guy who's good with books to, to kind of counter all these other fishermen that are following me around. That wasn't what drove him. What drove Jesus was he didn't see a tax collector. He saw an individual that needed a relationship with his Lord. And so Jesus went to that individual, Matthew, and he said, follow me. And we don't need to really discuss, you know, why it was that, that Matthew did that. I mean, there's a lot of speculation. You can say, well, obviously this is Jesus. His words are powerful. He tells Lazarus to rise from the dead, and he can't help but obey because that's what you have to do when Jesus speaks. Or the fact that Matthew probably knew Jesus to some extent, had some previous experience with him, so this wasn't just a blind out of the blue, follow me. But regardless, he invited him. He extended hospitality to Matthew. And then you see what Matthew did right away. Matthew did what Jesus did to him. Matthew hosted a party and welcomed not the elite, but tax collectors and other, other sinners. Because Matthew was already catching on that others needed to know Jesus as well. And as you might have expected, when Jesus does these radical things that Jesus does, it, it catches the attention of the Pharisees. Those who constantly are opposing Jesus throughout his ministry. And if we want to give them a little bit of leeway, not that they necessarily always deserve it, you can understand why they were so taken aback by Jesus associating with tax collectors and with other sinners, because they would have known the Old Testament. They would have known what Psalm 1 says in the very first verse, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. And here was Jesus doing all of those very things in their eyes. Jesus, you're not supposed to associate with sinners like that. But mark this difference. There's a difference between influencing and being influenced. Jesus was not gathering with these sinners to condone their lifestyle or their behavior. He was not gathering with them to take notes on how to be a better sinner. Jesus was gathering with them because he wanted to influence them and introduce them into the most important relationship that they could have. One with him, one with their Lord, one with the true God. That was what drove him, and that is, is what drives us in our acts of hospitality. As we consider today that a God-lived life is, is one of, of hospitality, where to can we eat with sinners? Where to can we extend this kind of radical love and generosity? The kind that we saw in our first reading from, from Genesis. Yes, that was part of the culture of the day to welcome in guests. But not to the degree that Abraham did. Have you ever stopped to really grasp how generous he was to these visitors? 
No, I, I will, this is a little bit of, of confession time. From time to time, we have individuals that come to the church looking for food. And I'll look and see what we have in, in our kitchen, which sometimes after a barbecue is a little bit more, uh, and, and happily send them. And if we don't have anything in the kitchen, I'll take them up to our house, up to the parsonage, and see what we have. But I will confess that I don't go through my pantry or refrigerator looking for the best that we have to offer this individual. I ask, hmm, what can we do without? What do we have more than enough of that this individual will appreciate at least this little bit? Well, that's not at all how Abraham approached this opportunity. And that's exactly how we saw it. An opportunity he said, show me favor. Give me this. Don't rob me of this opportunity to serve you and to lay out this feast before you. To kill the calf. To slaughter that. To say, Sarah, go get some, some flour for bread. You know how much flour that was? We're talking over 90 cups of flour. That's a whole lot of bread. And it wasn't as if Abraham just said, Sarah, go do the work and, and get the servants. But Abraham himself, he got his elbows dirty, slaughtered the calf, cooked it, prepared it, placed it before these guests. That is radical love for strangers. Speaking of which, that's really what the Greek word for hospitality is. Philip, Zenia. You might recognize some of those words if you break them down. If you're familiar with the city of Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Phyllis is love. Zenus, this is weird because I, I rarely reference movie references, and here's two in one sermon. But if you're familiar with my big fat Greek wedding, what is the dad concerned about? He doesn't want his daughter to marry a Zenus, a stranger, a foreigner. Get a good Greek guy, marry the good Greek guy, not this foreigner. That's the word, Zenus. So what does hospitality mean? Philip. Love strangers, foreigners. Love, not just, not just accept, not just tolerate, but love, show a radical love. Maybe this kind of radical love that Paul describes, writing to the Romans chapter five, verse eight, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not for good folks, not for those who are trying, not for those who show up in church once in a while or who give an offering, but while we were sinners, those are the people that Jesus came for. And when people recognize that, that Jesus comes for that lot of us, sinners like you and me, it changes us. The way that it changed Matthew. We don't identify Matthew as the tax collector anymore. He's Matthew, the disciple of Jesus. He's Matthew, the evangelist, the writer of the gospel. Why? Because he met and was introduced to Jesus and his life was radically changed. Because that's what happens when we introduce other people to Jesus. He changes lives, just as he changes ours. So he doesn't look at you and say, sinner. He looks at you and says, saint. Not because of what you have done, but because of what Jesus did for you. He looks at you and says, forgiven. He looks at you and says, a baptized child adopted into my family. He looks at you and says, come and join me at my table when I give you my body and blood to eat and to drink for the assurance that you truly, actually are forgiven. Not because of anything you've ever done or could do, but because of everything I have done for you that changes you and makes you and me and makes us want to be radical lovers of strangers. To show a hospitality that the world wouldn't know unless it saw it in you and me and believers. The Pharisees accused Jesus of, of doing wrong. Listen to to his response. Again, Matthew records it for us, the last couple of verses in this exchange. So it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Which is kind of a, well, duh. And yet it's a profound application here, isn't it? You don't call your doctor when you're sick and say, well, listen, I'm a doctor, but call me when you're better. Call me when you're feeling well, and then I'll see you. Then I'll make some time for you. That's not what doctors do. They help and they heal those who are sick. They serve those who, who aren't feeling well and try to do whatever they can to, to heal them. That is what Jesus has done for you. 
He didn't turn away from you, just as he didn't turn away from Matthew, but he came to you, the doctor, to serve those who are sick. And now he has made you well through the knowledge of forgiveness and grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And now he says, go and do likewise. Now he says to you, you are the doctor. Are you going to turn away from those who are sick? Because they aren't like you? Because your house isn't clean enough? Because you don't have the time? Because it's too much of a sacrifice? Because it isn't convenient? Because whatever other excuses and reasons we have, we're not radically being hospitable to those in need? Jesus came to, to serve us and make us well. Now are we going to leave those, those who are sick? Or are you as, as their doctor going to serve them as well? And Jesus isn't just interested in going through the motions. He's never been interested in just the outward acts, but rather what's in the heart that those outward actions reflect. Which is why he goes on as these verses wrap up to say, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The Pharisees thought they were righteous. The Pharisees were concerned about sacrifice and being seen for their sacrifices. They didn't care much for mercy. They didn't look at the people Jesus was hanging around and saying, Yes, Jesus, give them exactly what they need. Show them love and compassion and mercy. Because they are downtrodden and they are beaten down and, and nobody pays attention to them. They are, they are overlooked in society. Jesus wants, wants mercy. So as we carry out this God-lived life of hospitality, it is only done through a, a heart of faith that knows that I have been first on the receiving end of Jesus' radical hospitality. And that has not been without effect in my life. And it's going to show itself in how I treat others. When you think of, of why, why people gather, maybe for many of you, why you're here, why would anybody ever, in this day and age, where, where we live in a world, a society that is so skeptical and anti-church and anti-organization, why would anybody join or have anything to do with the church? Well, this might shock you. Much as I might like to say, oh, it's because our doctrine's really solid. It's because we stick to the Bible. It's because all of these reasons that you think should be the good churchy reasons. You know why it is? They're loved into the church. They should, they ought to see, and many of you have experienced in the church, through the way that we interact with others, a radical hospitality and a love that isn't found elsewhere in the world. And, and the only thing that we're seeking to do as we, we gain an audience with them, as we open up our homes to others and show radical hospitality, is they get to know us, they get to know our family, so that ultimately they get to know him. That they get to know the, the one relationship that matters, not, not just for changing this life radically, but for changing their eternity. You know how the... The rest of that scene plays out in Forrest Gump, don't you? After all of the other students reject little Forrest, there's a sweet voice of a little girl. Her name is Jenny. She's got a spot right next to her, and she, she invites Forrest Gump to come and sit down next to her. You know how the rest of the movie goes. It, it radically changes him. He, he loves her. He is devoted to her for the rest of, of his life. Dear friends, Jesus offers you and me something far greater than a seat on a, a bus. He offers us a, a relationship with, with him that will far surpass that of Forrest Gump and Jenny or, or any other relationship that you could have because this one is based entirely on God's grace and love and acceptance which come from his forgiveness. And, and so we want to, to eat with sinners. We want to open our doors and be radically hospitable to others so that they too I know that radical relationship with Jesus. May God bless us as we seek to live a God-lived life of hospitality.